this problem is, is pretty rare. They've asked it once. It, it exists in a ton of, of like textbooks. And it, it's, it's good to talk about this problem because this problem is unique in that it is a conservation of energy collision. And I know you said, I said to you, well, Mr. Shelton, you said that, that most collisions don't conserve energy. Yeah, most. Most don't. But there are elastic collisions. And this is one of the few collisions you could kind of set up in nature that would act like it was elastic. Um, this one's easier than most elastic collision questions in that we have information about the collision we wouldn't normally get. And I want to describe that in just a minute. But there is also something about this problem that um, is elusive. And it's hard to kind of imagine what's happening. So to talk about the elusive part, I want to show you a different version of this question, if you don't mind. And they'll ask you or give you the height of the little block on top of the big block. Okay, so let's describe this question for a minute and talk about what's happening. And I will flip back and forth between both of these because they are the same exact problem. First, there's a huge, huge piece of information given at the beginning that there is no friction anywhere in these problems. But there's no friction between the two blocks and each other, and there's no friction between the two blocks and the surface. I think they make it pretty clear somewhere in the middle. Yeah, there's the word frictionless. I see the word frictionless. Do you guys see the word frictionless? So I see it there. Um, in this one, this object has momentum at time zero. And it also has kinetic energy at time zero. Now, I've said to you before that when objects collide, energy is lost. Or what I've tried to infer is that energy is transformed into other forms that we can't easily identify sound and deformation of one object versus another, meaning like it gets squished or you drill a hole through something because you one object is getting embedded into the other. In this problem, we don't have any of that. So we can actually track where the energy goes. But also, momentum is always conserved, always. So there's a point here where both blocks are traveling at the same linear speed. Can you guys follow that argument? Like there's a time where both this block and this block move at this speed. Does everybody understand what I just said? Because what I'm gonna say here is, is gonna be kind of important in a minute and I wanna make sure I've got this all the way out so I'm gonna zoom way in just in this picture. Just before that happened, this block was still moving upwards and to the right, while this block was just moving to the right. So this one was moving faster than this one. Then there was a moment where both blocks had the exact same speed for just an instant. And then, this one started coming back down off of the block, and this one started speeding up. All of that's taking place in just a few instances. Does everybody follow along so far? So what this ends up being is a collision that actually takes a long time. I said that all the other collisions took place the instant before and the instant after, but this one, the collision is the whole time the one object is climbing up the other one and then coming back down. But, and this is important, the whole time, momentum has to be conserved. The whole time. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because this stage right here in the middle, and this is where, you, this is where the notes are important. This is where you want to write something down. This stage in the middle, right here, between this and this, represents a perfectly inelastic collision. Because this is the instant that both objects have the same speed. It only exists for an instant. It's only for like a, a moment in time. Like when you throw something in air and we say that it goes all the way up and it stops and it comes back. How long has it stopped? 
Not long, an instant, right? An instant in time. That's true here too. So this happens for just an instant. And because of that, you can treat it like a perfectly inelastic collision. I can say M times V naught for this object has to be equal to, uh, what am I supposed to use? 3M. Okay, so M plus 3M times V1. And I'm pretty sure the first question is, what, find an expression for V1? Yeah. And there it is. Now, this is the part that I, 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 I kind of think is interesting. I, I like it. It's neat. Um, energy is conserved. Meaning, the energy that this block had gets transformed into potential energy. Not some energy that we can't recover. In most collisions, we can't recover where that energy went. But in this collision, we can. That's the trick. That's the thing you need to know. There's this portion, and at this instant, the energy is also conserved. Beforehand, there was kinetic energy just in the block by itself. During this collision, in the middle of this collision, both blocks have kinetic energy. But also, the little block has potential energy. Gravitational potential energy. I bet the next question was, how high on the other block does this block go? Mm -hmm. So you can eliminate V1 between them. That's the trick. Fun. I just like this part. This is my favorite part of this problem, and I want to highlight it. There's a trick, and once you know the trick, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. You just got to know the trick. So everybody got the trick? See it in there? I like it. It's a neat problem. Um, you guys want to talk about this one? This one is a reasonable question to have on your test. It's not, it's not as difficult as it looks. How many of you tried it? All right. Do you realize that the person in the swing has more energy here than they will have here, than the swing will have here? Sorry, the swing will have, because it doesn't swing as high. So do you realize you could figure out how much gravitational potential energy is here and figure out how much gravitational potential energy is here? That loss in energy had to be the energy this guy has. Where else could the energy have gone? Do you follow me? So there's a kind of a collision question, but not really, not as much as you think. So here's how this problem is done. And it's, it's not, there's a lot of words here, but we need to figure out how fast this person's going when they make it here. And we already know how to do this. There's gravitational potential energy here and there's kinetic energy here. Afterwards, the swing, just the swing, has kinetic energy that's going to be converted into potential energy. So what's missing in this problem is the fact that there is a moment where the person and swing separate into two distinct objects. That's your collision. Collision. Right? They don't actually collide. The person jumps off the swing. So they push themselves forwards, slowing the swing down. So there is a momentum question in the middle. We need to figure out the velocity of the person and swing before they jump off so that we can use it to figure out the velocity of the person and swing after they jump off. The fact that the swing 
goes from one height to another means we know the swing slowed down, right? Lost momentum. That momentum has to be with the person. So, um, 60 degrees, you should be able to, you, this is the part you can memorize, remember? Um, they tell us that the mass of the child is capital M, is that right? And is it the same as the swing? So the swing is M and the child is M. So they're both the same mass. That's a heavy swing. Would you put your child on the swing that weighed as much as a child? I don't know. That hit him in the head, that would hurt him. And have you ever seen a kid get hit in the head by a swing? Mm -hmm. Every kid at a playground eventually gets hit in the head by a swing. How many of you like, they're good times. Um, this part's not hard in that there's kinetic energy at the bottom. And at the top, there's gravitational potential energy. I'm just kind of writing it out because I'm under the impression that you remember we can do this. Right. We've memorized the height based on the angle. So there it is. And that's how you figure out how fast the person and swing are going at the bottom just before the collision. And then this side's the same. This is the kinetic energy of just the swing. Yeah. Kinetic energy of just the swing, it has to equal the potential energy of just the swing, but that's still gonna be one half mv swing squared equals mgl one minus cosine 45. That's how you figure out the velocity of the swing. The collision, which occurred in the middle, is 2m, the mass, mass of both people, times the, vol I'm sorry, the mass of the swing and the person, times v, which is going to have to equal m times the velocity of the person plus m times the velocity of the swing. That's the collision part. So you get the velocity of the swing from here. You get the velocity of both of them from here. And that's how you figure out the velocity of the person. What's the trick? They're using the angle of the swing to tell you velocity. And they're hiding that. They're also hiding the fact that there's a collision in there. It doesn't look like a collision. Because in all the collisions we've had, one object hits another object. You don't think of a collision as two objects separating. But it's the same math. Momentum is conserved. This, um, trying to, to throw something at you, I think that this is a reasonable problem. And I have not used it as an example yet. But I think you can imagine it. A little box hits a big box and sticks to it. What's the maximum compression of the spring after the collision? It's the same as asking how high up the ramp it goes after the collision. It's just this time the energy is not going to gravitational potential. It's going into elastic potential. Is that okay? You guys see that all right? I am not going to ask the question I probably want to ask. Do you remember? When's it traveling the fastest? What's the maximum compression of the spring? I like this question. And if you want, I can give you a interesting FRQ practice tonight. I just don't know if I'll have a chance to get a solution written. But in the literature, there is a problem that looks like this. One box is dropped on another box, they stick together, and then they ask how far the spring is compressed. This is a very hard question. 
I'm not giving that to you tomorrow, but it's in the literature. And some people tend to walk around and look at it. I could give this for practice tonight, and we could talk about it during tutoring if you want. But this one's harder than what I'm looking to give you tomorrow. All right. So MV naught equals MV prime plus 3MV final. Uh, let's simplify that, get rid of the Ms. So V naught equals V prime plus 3VF. I don't like the prime, it's, I hate it, but that's what they want us to use. So, yeah. This is the momentum equation. I'm gonna do the square. I'm gonna do the kinetic energy in just a minute. So the kinetic energy is one half m v naught squared, and that has to be equal to one half m v prime squared plus one half three m v final squared. Uh, in this one, all the one halves go, and all the m's go. So, so I get v naught squared equals um, v prime squared plus three v final squared. Um, there's a variety of ways to go from here. Uh, probably, you know, I'd want to eliminate v prime. I think it's the easiest one to eliminate. We're allowed to have v naught in our answer, so we're trying to solve for vf or v prime. We need both. So we can't have, we can't have V prime in our answer for VF, and we can't have VF in our answer for V prime. So we need to get an equation that eliminates one. I would probably eliminate V prime. I think it's the easiest one to eliminate. So I would say that V prime equals V naught minus three VF. And I would sub that in here. Now, this part's not fun. It's math, and there's a lot of it. But you might be surprised how straightforward this math is, even though, look, I get it. It's a lot of Vs. It was bad enough when there was lots of different letters. Now they all look like the same letter. But it'll be okay. And I'm coming to grips with how nerve-wracking this must be. But, so I'm going to sub in. And I get V naught minus 3 VF quantity squared plus 3 VF squared. Now, there's no way around it. you got to square that term. But you guys know how to square a binomial. Do you have, like, some fancy thing you learned when you were a kid? I, mean, I don't have a fancy one. You square the first term. You multiply the two things together and double it. So that's minus 6 V naught VF. And then you square the second term, plus 9vf squared. That's what I learned to do. Square the first term, multiply them together and double them, and square the last term. And then add the last term, 3vf squared. It's a v naught squared there. Um, this ends up being a lot easier than it looks because you can cancel out the two v naught squared. Do you see it? So cancel those out. So I get zero equals minus six V naught VF plus 12 VF squared. Everybody okay with my algebra so far? All right, so this is all just algebra, but it's messy algebra. But do you see some stuff here? Like I can cancel out the six and just leave this as two. Now, a lot of people want to cancel out the VF. Don't do that, please. Factor it out. So I'll factor out a VF, and I'll get negative V naught plus 2 VF. And I get two answers for VF. Everybody good so far? It's important to get both answers. This is the first time I've done an elastic collision. Um, I'm unlikely to give you one on your test tomorrow, but this is great practice, and I want you to see this because if you've done it right, 
you get back the answer that VF had at the start. What was the speed of the incline before the collision? Zero. That's why you get it here again. It's a possible outcome. The block could have missed the incline. And what would its speed be? It'd be zero. So you have to get back the initial speed of the object before the collision. That's how you know you've done it right. And we now know that the, uh, after the collision, the incline is going to move it one half V naught. Excellent. So I need to figure out V prime, but we have a way to do that, don't we? It's right there. So V prime equals V naught minus three VF. V prime equals V naught minus three VF, which is one half V naught. which says V prime equals um, one minus three halves is negative one half V naught. The block's going backwards. Now, let's zoom out. There is no shortcut. You understand? You have to do the algebra, there's no shortcut. There are other ways to do this algebra. And most of them don't save you any time. This is why it's not an AP exam hardly ever. Do you see why? Because it's just so much math that has nothing to do with the physics. All of that so that you would have to get this negative sign so you'd have to be able to determine whether it was moving forwards or backwards. It's a lot of math for just that. The physics in this ended the moment you said that these two things were true. The only other thing that's possibly physics is getting here and determining what that negative sign means. That's a lot of algebra. If you have a 15 minute FRQ, I'll be honest, if you see this on the exam and you, 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 you know what to do, I would tell you, come back to it and do the other stuff that's on the exam. Because this, even if you know exactly what to do, it might not be worth the number of points you have to get. As I've tried to explain to students, you have to work at a rate of one point per minute. If this takes you seven minutes and it's only worth three points, you understand you're four points in the hole now? You've lost the potential to earn four other points elsewhere. They will put this problem first on the exam. On purpose. They're going to do that. The first problem is usually the most time-consuming problem. I almost always tell students to just read through it real quick and find the easiest one. Do that one first. Build up some time, put it in the bank, then go to these other questions. Yeah? How many points would it be to just say set that part, the big first part up? If you set this part up, you are very likely to get three quarters of the available points for that section. So if this one was worth, I mean, because I'm looking at what would, what would I have offered for points based on what I've seen on other exams? Um, probably one point for that, one point for that. Whoops, not two, one point. One point for that. One point for recognizing that you're going to have to do substitution. Then, because of what this one asks, one point for getting an expression for the final velocity, one point for getting an expression for the other thing's velocity, and probably one point for issuing it to the left. So three points there, three points there, um, maybe six. I don't know. I have to look this one up. I still think you, in the modern exam, you would probably get three quarters of the points. This is me showing you get half, but I think you'd get three quarters of the points. I don't think they would... Like, I don't think they would ask for both of the two objects' velocities, even though you kind of have to get them. But I just don't think they'd make you do this. All right. There's, the problem you just saw is related to another problem that is almost, almost the exact same question. And I've, I've not brought it up yet because I, I needed a moment after we had kind of gone through the material. And here's the, the other version of this problem. One block fired towards another block, but the second block has a spring out in front of it. In this problem, there's a moment Well, that didn't work out exactly like I hoped. There we go. 
All right, in this problem, you can think of three different parts. The initial condition, what we had there at the top, a condition where the red brick and blue brick are in contact and the spring is compressed and both of them are moving. And then there's the future of the problem where they've separated again. And each block is moving. So something like that. But here, they're stuck together and they're moving. In this problem, they would ask how much is the spring compressed, the maximum compression of the spring. Or they'll give you the maximum compression of the spring. But understand, the boxes are moving all the time. Same trick exists here. Spring constant of K will make it the exact same question. This is M, this is 3M. This is V0, this is V1. They ask this question on the exam more frequently, more frequently than I'd like. It's about once every five to eight years a question like this pops up. It's not super often, but you have to know the trick, and the trick here is the same. At this instant, when both boxes are moving at the same speed, the spring isn't being compressed anymore. After this moment, the boxes will separate. Before this moment, they were still coming together, but at the moment both boxes have the same speed, the spring isn't changing anymore. That's a perfectly inelastic collision. That's the, that's the um, exact moment of the perfectly inelastic collision. So, momentum has to be conserved at that instant because momentum is conserved the whole time. But because there's no losses to friction or sound or heat or anything like that, energy is being conserved and tracked. So... At that instant, the kinetic energy of the little box has to be equal to the kinetic energy of both boxes plus the potential energy stored in the spring. This question would ask, what is the maximum compression of the spring? That's X. Again, 